and thank you for joining us today. We're so glad with our turnout today, and I hear that several of you are still joining us. My name is Teresa Lee, and I am the Assistant Executive Director of the Dairy Calf and Heifer Association. I will be your moderator for today's webinar. DCHA is excited to provide these quarterly webinars as a way to share relevant and useful information from the experts in our industry. Just to let you know, your lines have been placed on mute, so we eliminate as much background noise as possible. If you have questions during the presentation, please submit them via the website. Using that top navigation bar, click on the Q&A tab, type in your question, and then click on the Ask button. The questions will be submitted to me, and we will go through as many as time allows during the Q&A session that follows the presentation. So again, click on that Q&A tab, submit your question, and click on the Ask button. On behalf of DCHA, I would like to recognize our sponsor for today's webinar, Fermentin, brought to you by Arm & Hammer Animal Nutrition. The Rumen Fermentation Enhancer Fermentin will help you raise bigger heifers faster. And now I have the pleasure of introducing you to today's speaker, Dr. Mike Van Amberg. Dr. Van Amberg is an associate professor at the Department of Animal Sciences at Cornell University, where he has a dual appointment in teaching and research. He teaches multiple courses and works extensively with the Dairy Fellows Program, advises approximately 50 students, and is also the advisor for the Cornell Dairy Science Club. The focus of Mike's research program for the last 15 years has been to further the understanding of nutrient requirements of dairy calves and heifers. He has also studied aspects of endocrine control of developmental functions such as mammary development and puberty. He currently leads the development of the Cornell Net Carbohydrate and Protein System. During our question and answer session, at the conclusion of the presentation, Dr. Van Amberg will be joined by Dr. Gene Boomer, Manager, Field Technical Services for Arm & Hammer Animal Nutrition. I'd now like to turn the webinar over to Dr. Van Amberg. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here. And uh, in the interest of time, I'm just going to get on with the, uh, the webinar so we can get to the question and answers. So um, my, uh, the discussion this afternoon uh, will involve these topics. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about colostrum, but I'm going to talk about colostrum um, probably from a slightly different perspective. We always focus on IgGs and uh, immune function, but I'm, I'm going to share with you data that will maybe help you understand that there are things in colostrum other than uh, immunoglobulins that are important for the calf and help, uh, help the calf do things other than develop an immune system. I'm going to talk briefly about some nutrient requirements, uh, and then I'm going to uh, get into the data on uh, pre-weaning nutrition and uh, future productivity. So questions that we've been asking, and I'm, I'm going to digress here for a minute. I'm going to back up. A lot of the uh, a lot of the thought process from this or about this data that I'm going to share with you, and I, I say this a lot, but it, it came from you never know where questions are going to come from and how they're going to be framed. But many years ago, when we were doing one of our early um, calf studies, we had published a little bit of data. Uh, our first publication on, on nutrient requirements, and we had had calves growing at over three pounds a day in that study. And uh, to many in the industry, that growth rate was, you know, abnormal actually and extraordinary and, and completely out of context for how we traditionally raise dairy calves. And in the process, there was a journalist who had come to interview me and uh, my graduate students about that, and, and she, she came with a certain perspective, and she asked, a, in the process, though, of the interview, she asked a very, um, what I thought was very important question, a very poignant question, and one that, that still resonates with me, and that was, if we feed calves better, will they make better milk cows? And, I, <laughs> and I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but that really caught me by surprise, and, 
it took me several minutes to, to get myself around that question because we were still trying to figure out what the energy and protein requirements were. And my thought process at the time was, and my answer was, how do you know what we're doing right now isn't inhibiting their ability to make milk? And, and that's kind of the genesis of all of this. So it was a, kind of a casual question asked during an interview that drove my thinking on this and, and why we've been focused on it ever since. So with that, um, questions that we're asking, uh, which we think are both practical and of research importance, are does early life, early life nutrition and management affect lifetime productivity? Can we program these calves to do something different during their lifetime by altering their colostrum status, by altering their nutrient status prior to weaning. We know this about other species. We know that we can do this with mice. We know something about humans um, and maybe pigs now. You know, so so that question is being asked uh, of calves. Do is this the uh, or you know, and I use the term programming. I think we can reprogram calves. Is this the anybody who remembers the genetics course? You know, which is not too many of you, I'm sure, unless you're a geneticist. The, um, <laughs> is this the permanent environmental effect that our, just our genetics people used to talk about or still kind of talk about? I remember hearing that term and never really knowing what to do with it, but now I, I have a different context now, and I think what it means is, you know, they're, they're born with a certain complement of DNA that they inherited from their, their parents and their grandparents, uh, and that allows them a certain genetic potential. But what we think now is that we can alter how that DNA is expressed by all sorts of environmental cues, and we've known the difference there between the genetic and the phenotypic expression. Um, but I think now we're getting a better handle on it. You know, then we can ask the question, if, if this is all true, what factors are responsible? Research questions, you know, how do we know? What should we be looking for? You know, and those are things that we're, we're currently working on. You know, so as we move, if we move into colostrum, you know, and I, I have this pretty bold statement up there, colostrum is the foundation for functional change, all right? So we, for years, we've talked about colostrum being absolutely important to ensure that we get enough immunoglobulins into the calf for, them, for at least the first three to five weeks for them to have a viable immune system. And I think that those are still relatively important. As a biologist, I could make an argument that that's a transient requirement because once they start to, once they gain exposure, once they gain exposure to um, some challenge or some bacteria or some virus, they're going to build their own immunoglobulins. So in a way, you could say it's transitory and maybe it's not even necessary, although we know that's not true and cats will, will die at a faster rate and will have more sickness if we don't get enough IgS into the system. But, and, and the reason I frame it that way is that there are lots of other things in colostrum that have been studied in the short term, but never given long-term consideration. Uh, one example of that would be IGF-1 or IGF-2. We know that IGF-1 is one of the major protein synthetic uh, uh, hormones out there, and, and we, all the current data would say that it, it's, there's a lot in colostrum, but it never really gets out of the gastrointestinal tract. Um, we might have some data that says that's not true. We just have to look more short term. But a question might be, does I, is IGF-1 responsible for part of these long-term effects that I'm going to talk about? We can talk about IGF-2, lactoferrin. Prolactin looks like a pretty good candidate. There's prolactin in colostrum. Could very well be that prolactin is absorbed in that calf just like IGs are absorbed in that calf in the first few hours of life and that first feeding could be vitally important for setting up some other function that we don't understand. And I'll, I'll give you some examples of what I'm talking about in a minute. Insulin, there's high amounts of insulin in colostrum. Uh, leptin is another one. Uh, we're currently studying the role of leptin in neonates. Could very well be that leptin is important in setting up the hypothalamic pituitary axis, could change appetite control uh, very early in life, and I'll give you an example of that here in a minute or it could change the way calves partition nutrients. Uh, relaxin, also a hormone produced by cows and you find in colostrum. We now know that uh, it's produced in humans, dogs, and pigs. We know that in pigs, relaxin is vitally important in that first meal 
um, to help stimulate uterine development in a female pig, and that we now know that the more relaxing that pig receives in that first meal, the greater her reproductive efficiency in later life. And, you know, we have struggled with reproductive efficiency in our high-producing cows. You know, with this kind of information in pigs, now it makes me wonder, <laughs> is that something that we've missed? You know, is there some programming or imprinting or epigenetics that we can accomplish by making sure that they get a higher amount of relaxant as a calf uh, in that first meal? So there are things like that that we're thinking about. I'll give you some, some background as to why we're thinking about things like that. But we, we are beginning to believe there's a lot more to that first meal than IgGs. It doesn't mean that IgGs aren't important, but it looks like maybe some of these other things are as important as we look at later life. So in, to that point about um, to relaxing, uh, this was just this idea was just kind of synthesized in a paper from a couple years ago. They call it the lactocrine hypothesis, you know, and this is really talking about epigenetic programming. And, and the idea here is that is that mom can have an influence on the calf after the calf, or in this case, in the piglet, after the piglet has left the uterus or the placenta. All right, and they, they would do that through compounds or hormones or some products that happen to be in that first milk or in later milk that impart some activity on the calf or the pig. And in this case, uh, in the case of pigs, as I previously mentioned, uh, they now know that pigs who receive a higher amount of relaxin in the first meal um, have uh, – better reproductive efficiency, this relaxin is important to stimulate the effect of estrogen uh, in differentiation of the, uh, of the uterine tissue, all right? So we don't know if this is true in, in calves, um, but it sure makes a lot of sense because cows produce a lot of relaxin, and we know it's, it's in quite high concentrations in, uh, in colostrum. So this idea of being able to impact the calf after it's left mom through milk or milk components or colostrum and colostrum components, components is, uh, is pretty interesting, and we think this, this bears some more work. You know, and, and where have we seen evidence of this kind of behavior? Uh, and there's a large literature on this. You know, we talk about calves with a failure passive transfer or calves that didn't get enough colostrum, so they didn't have a high enough Ig concentration in their blood or plasma. Uh, you know, and, and in those situations, and again, we've always been focused on IGs, and that's what we've tended to measure as an industry and even as academics. And we can point to, you know, studies where, you know, calves with an FPT had delayed time to first calving, right? Well, if you had a delayed time to first calving, then we most likely had delayed time to first breeding, which means slower growth rates. Uh, in the paper, papers by Nosek and Robinson, uh, decreased average daily gain was observed calves with an FPT, not necessarily sicker, not necessarily more antibiotic treatments or more respiratory or more diarrhea. They just didn't tend to grow as fast. And if you looked at the data from Robinson, they actually followed them out into lactation, and that first they could detect a decrease in a statistical significant decrease in milk and fat production in the first lactation in those calves that had not received adequate IGs in that first meal. So there, that I think is interesting because it says something that went on in the first hour or two of life carried all the way through the first lactation. All right, so some evidence that this is not just a, a pre-weaning event. All right, some work that we did uh, when at, with Agway. This was a joint project between uh, Agway, Land O'Lakes, and Cornell. And a study conducted on a, good, on a very good farm in western New York with impeccable records. You know, 400 calves followed them through breeding. You know, we looked at three different milk replacers, two different intake levels, um, high-protein milk replacers, good quality starter. And what we learned is nothing really mattered <laughs> in this study except for uh, whether they had good colostrum status or not. And, again, in this study we were looking simply at Ig status, and we characterized that as plasma protein less than 5.5 milligrams, but those calves with an FPT uh, had approximately 50% less feed efficiency. They ate the same amount of dry matter, or they consumed the same amount of dry matter, 
uh, and they had no difference in treatments. There was no greater antibiotic treatment, uh, no greater respiratory disease, no greater diarrhea with the calves that didn't have adequate Ig status. They just didn't use the nutrients as well as we would have liked or as well as those animals that did have adequate Ig status. So again, you know, we, we talk about IGs and we focus on that, but looking at some of those other components in colostrum, we're now beginning to believe that, that FPT or this lack of IG is really just a proxy for also a lack of some of those other uh, components. Uh, this study published uh, a few years ago now in the Professional Animal Scientist. Uh, this was actually a follow-up study by the group in Arizona. These brown Swiss calves were provided two or four liters of colostrum, and I think everybody who knows calves has seen this study, you know, but it leads to a couple questions. First of all, you know, it's, it's two liters or four liters of colostrum at birth, and then they followed them all the way through uh, to breeding. Well, their prepubertal average daily gain uh, was about half a pound a day different. All right, so the, so the question there is, if they were all treated the same, they were all kept in the same pens post-colostrum, and all fed the same diet, did they consume more feed if they were given greater amounts of colostrum? Or did they convert nutrients with greater efficiency and consume the same amount of feed? And neither of those questions could be answered here in this particular study, but it's, it's pretty telling to see that something that was done in the first couple hours of life impacted pre average daily gain, impacted survival through the second lactation, and had a modest impact on milk production through the second lactation, right? So again, the idea that something that's happening in the first couple hours of life is having a long-term productive positive effect on, on these animals, right? So the idea that we can program them and that there are things in these, in colostrum that will enhance their ability to make milk in, you know, despite their genetic uh, or their DNA makeup. Um, this study was published in the Journal of Dairy Science. This was some nice work done down at Virginia Tech, Colleen Mowry Jones. And what we see here, this was an interesting study in that they were evaluating colostrum versus a, a very common colostrum replacement. And what was fun about this is that both the colostrum and the colostrum replacer supplied uh, adequate and equal Ig status. So it says that the colostrum replacer was actually very good at uh, at supplying the Igs that we always want to see. So and, and that's really been the purpose for a colostrum replacer. And if you look at the uh, the growth components, and then the milk replacers were either a non-animal plasma or animal containing, uh, animal protein containing milk replacer or had animal plasma in it in both treatments. And we can see really that there wasn't that much of a difference in total dry matter intake. There wasn't that much of a difference in uh, milk replacer and or starter intake. But what I want to draw your attention to is the calves fed the colostrum had almost twice the feed efficiency as those calves fed the colostrum replacer. And this is not to say that the colostrum replacer is bad. What it says is the colostrum replacer did exactly what we wanted it to. It provided adequate IGs so the calf could develop and have a normal immune response in the case of a challenge. But what it does say is there are things in the colostrum above IGs or beyond the IGs that are impacting feed efficiency of these calves, right? And in this particular case, it's a very good example of where calves pretty much ate the same thing, uh, and this kind of lends to the idea that colostrum is enhancing feed efficiency independent of uh, intake control. Finally, this study here um, was a study conducted uh, by uh, Jim Drakeley and one of his grad students, Johan. And they fed a, a pound and a quarter of a conventional 2220 milk replacer in what they called uh, an intensified milk replacer, which was a 2820. They used the same starter. And then they characterized the calves by Ig status on both treatments. They split them into four groups. They characterized them to either poor Ig status or good Ig status. 
and had pretty representative numbers across all groups. And here are the, the serum IGs, and you can see that there's a dramatic difference between what they call poor and, and what was good. And you can, and what it's more interesting here in my mind is that, you know, so these calves did tend to be, or were obviously different in IG status, but on the conventionally fed calves, there was no difference in average daily gain. Okay, and this doesn't surprise me because given this amount of milk replacer, um, their intake over maintenance uh, is going to be pretty low. They're, they're going to be just above maintenance requirements, so they shouldn't have a lot of energy from milk replacer to promote a lot of growth. And they would, most of this growth most likely came from the consumption of the starter. Whereas if you look at the intensified fed calves that were given uh, about twice the amount of uh, milk replacer, now we see this difference in, in average daily gain bearing out. So this isn't a difference in uh, feed efficiency, but it is a difference in average daily gain. And those calves that were given more calories um, with higher IG status grew at a faster rate than those with poor IG status. And again, in my mind, and given all the previous data, I am beginning to believe that this isn't necessarily related to IG status, but this is related to all the other factors that are in colostrum that are promoting uh, this type of efficiency. All right, so that's our way of looking at it. So it says we've got to look beyond IGs. So I think the take home from this, this part of the talk, there are factors in colostrum that, that impact pre and post weaning feed efficiency. And the data that's available, including some of our data that we're currently summarizing, that, that range in feed efficiency is somewhere between 12 and 26 percent, um, which is pretty substantial, actually, for this age of animal. The, the regulation of feed intake for satiety is most likely influenced by colostrum post-weaning, uh, and, uh, and the combination of the two effects appears to be for life. It looks like these feed efficiency effects, uh, once, they're, once they're set, are there for the long term. And as I pointed out earlier, the data from, from pigs suggests that there are other developmental functions that are being affected by colostrum. In the case of pigs, it was reproduction via relaxin, and this is obviously something we should be thinking about in cats. So now we'll move on, and I'll talk about some of the things relative to productivity. This. Uh, and I remember going to many talks and listening to my colleagues stand up and talk about all the other classes of cattle, lactating cows, dry cows, transition cows, high producing cows, didn't really matter what we were talking about. They all had benchmarks, they all had proactive goals, they all had positive rules of thumb, and, and we calf guys would get up there and talk about mortality and morbidity and sickness and diarrhea and scours. Um, and or mammary development, uh, but we never really talked about, gee, what should be an optimum growth rate for a calf? And, and uh, I, I walked away from those meetings pretty frustrated uh, sometimes personally and uh, went through the literature, looked at our own data and said, well, I think a first, in my mind, the first objective, and, and DCHA has adopted this, as has BAM and a few others, and that is to double the birth weight by 56 days. So if these calves, these Holstein calves, are being born at 90 pounds by 56 days, they should be at least 180 pounds. And in farms that are now measuring these things, we're seeing lots of uh, data that are a lot in between here. We've had some herds in, in western New York say, you know, we're doing fine, we're doing fine. They go out and weigh the calves, and at weaning they're actually 135 to 145 pounds. And, and what they were really reflecting on was the fact that the calves didn't die <laughs> and were reasonably healthy, uh, but they really weren't growing, all right? And, and this growth rate is really designed, this doubling the birth weight is, the concept there is to capture some of this milk production at the end of the cycle. So there's lots of other goals we can have here. Mortality less than five, there are herds definitely that can do that. Morbidity less than 10, there are herds that can do that. Lots of reasons why we should be doing this. Uh, the one that I'm going to spend most of the time on today is this one, potentially increased milk yield. Um, and we won't have time to get into herd life, but we do have some elements of data now that will tell us that herd life most likely will also go up um, if we do some of these things. 
So, and I, this is not new information. I'm going to give it some different context. I think one of the things that I still see happening in the industry, and I'm going to circle back around to this with some of our own data, is that is that there are, you know, calves are pretty comfortable between 60 and 81 degrees, um, and I think it's probably greater than 21 days of age. pre wean calves are pretty comfortable between 60 and 81. Once we go above 81, we've got to do something about heat abatement, uh, shade, um, shade cloth, whatever it might be, fans, uh, and we'll pick up some feed efficiency. Um, anything below 60 degrees, you know, we can outfeed that, but if you probably can't do it with dry feed, we're going to have to figure out how to do it with milk or milk replacer. Um, and, you know, like I say this, in New York, we spend at least 160 days a year below the lower critical temperature. And we know these numbers, we're very comfortable with the maintenance requirement of the calf. The NRC numbers are very good. Uh, the data that from, from Drake Lee's group and my group, we've challenged those numbers. Uh, they're pretty set, you know, and we're pretty comfortable with the adjustments that need to be made. Um, and even in our own shop here at the Cornell Research Farm and that data that I'll share with you, you're going to find out that we've learned that even though we think we do a good job feeding calves, we're still not being dynamic enough with meeting the maintenance requirements to get the full potential out of these calves. <laughs> Again, back to the idea that we're feeding well above maintenance in, in July, but we're probably not feeding that much above maintenance in, in December, January, and February, and I'm going to show you what that means for milk production here in a little bit. So I think as an industry, we've got to get more dynamic and we've got to get better at thinking about this critically and saying, you know what, from October 1, you know, it depends on where you live, but from October 1 in New York to uh, April 1st, we probably need to make sure we're getting at least 25 to 30 percent more calories in these calves from liquid feed just to overcome some of these maintenance challenges because in the end it looks like it's going to pay off. You know, and we've had these tables out for a long time in the NRC. You can open up the NRC model and do this. And as I've pointed out several times, you take a 100-pound calf at maintenance, it's a pound of dry matter a day at 68 degrees to meet their maintenance requirements. You get down to freezing temperatures, it's 1.3. Doesn't sound like a big change, and if you're talking to most uh, nutritionists and or dairy producers, three-tenths of a pound doesn't sound like a lot, and that's not something we could measure in high-producing lactating cows, but it is a 30% increase in dry matter intake for this, this class of animal. So for this guy, this is a, or these calves, it's a tremendous amount of energy, and we need to be cognizant of that, and we can't expect them to get that extra energy through dry feed intake, especially in those calves less than four weeks of age. They just don't have the capacity, the rumen function is not upregulated enough to derive enough energy from that to move into the tissues and use it for um, heat generation. You know, and then if you want them to grow at at least a pound a day, you know, here are the numbers that are necessary. And it's, you can see by looking at these two tables, you know, that once you get above maintenance, that animal is incredibly efficient at this stage of life. It doesn't take much above maintenance, unless, you know, to, especially with the right protein content, uh, to get these calves to grow at a pretty significant rate, right? So, but we've got to be above the maintenance requirement to get that accomplished. And, and the reality is, and we're working with this data now to build a new model and make this available to nutritionists, you know, between, between Cornell, University of Illinois, Virginia Tech, and Michigan State, we've harvested well over 400 calves and heifers. Uh, actually, the count that I have right now is, is almost 600 between all of those uh, institutions. And, and so we can build, you know, from birth all the way up to just about calving. So we can build a very robust or refine our model and build a robust model for everybody to use in the field. And I think that's been one of our downfalls in the field is that we don't give nutritionists really good tools to go out and evaluate this. So as a nutritionist and somebody who's involved in model development, I take a little bit of blame there because we have not provided the nutritionists with the right tools to go out and evaluate these. We're working on that. We've got the data. But I also think what we learned here through all of this work is we can, we can now manipulate the composition of gain of these calves. We can make them fat. We can make them thin. We can make them lean. We can change their fatty acid composition. 
uh, if you'd have asked us that 15, 20 years ago, we'd have said, no, that's probably not possible, and now we know that that's possible. So we've made really big inroads into understanding the metabolism of the calf. You know, we've also learned in this process that calves don't make fats and carbohydrates, right? So we can feed them a very high carbohydrate diet, and they're never going to make a lot of fat. Matter of fact, they'll make no fat. So if we want a calf to accrete any fat, and we want them to have fat to be able to burn, that has to be in the diet, right? The less fat, the, the, as we take fat out of the diet, we make those calves very lean. As we change the fatty acid composition of the fat, we can change their composition also. And it's a very interesting uh, tool that is a little expensive yet, but it will eventually find itself in the field, okay? So we know how to do all of this. Right, and, and the quick summary of the data right now is in this table, uh, something that we put together from the Illinois and Cornell data sets from uh, several years ago now. We published this in a European uh, publication, and nobody here really references or likes to use it because it's not here, so we're going to republish it here. But it basically says that, that uh, you know, if you want those calves to grow faster, you now this is no surprise, they're going to need more energy. They're going to have to eat more dry matter. But I think what's fun about it is it says, you know what, we're going to have to increase the protein requirement or the protein content of those milk replacers. If it's milk replacer, uh, milk's going to be close to this anyhow because the calf is telling us that if we want these optimum gains, that we need to be in that 26 to 28% crude protein range. You know, and, and as we get closer to the amino acid requirements of these calves, which we're getting, we're also working on, we might be able to drop that protein down to maybe 24 or 25 as long as we supplement the right amino acids, but we're a little bit away from that yet. But this basically says, you know, if you want them to grow just above maintenance, an 18% crude protein milk replacer is okay because they really have no demand because you're not asking them to do anything. But the moment that you want them to actually accrete or grow and put on some protein tissue and put on some muscle, that you're going to have to give them some more protein to work with. And I think this is really important as we think about this long-term milk response because I think the milk response is tied to protein synthesis. And the greater the protein synthesis, um, the greater the productivity of these animals. Uh, the greater the protein synthesis from birth to at least 49 days, the greater the productivity of these animals. So it's not just an energetic aspect or per perspective, but it's also the protein. So now I'm going to move into uh, the productive part of this. You know, and, and basically, you know, we've got pretty good data now. We don't really understand what's going on, you know, which that's okay. We're in a different, as academics, we're in a slightly different position. We can come to the industry and, you say, and say to you guys, you know what, if we do this, we get more milk, and we can put some economics to that now, and, and it's actually a positive thing, and it says we know how to, to do things with calves that we didn't understand that are positive for milk production, positive for the dairy industry. There's a lot of people who study candidate genes never really knowing <laughs> if that gene is actually going to turn into something that will be a benefit to the industry. So we're in the reverse side of that. We've actually got the productive response. Now we need to work backwards and figure out what's going on. And that's a, it's not a bad place to be. It's a lot more fun, actually. So, so the data that got me excited, you know, and I made the point about the journalist asking me the question. Well, I immediately ran upstairs to my office, opened up the Journal of Dairy Science, and found this paper from 1998, from the month before, that said calves that were allowed to suckle the dam at least five times a day produced about a thousand pounds more milk. So I ran around Morrison Hall showing that to my colleagues, and they all said, gee, Mike, that's really nice, but I wouldn't stake your career on that. Um, so I took that as a challenge because I got pretty excited about looking at, you know, the, the idea that that might actually be a real thing. Contacted some researchers in Denmark that I knew had worked on calves and said, have you guys ever done any research like this? Well, that's when the, the fax machine started working, and out came a couple papers. This Folder and Crone, 94, uh, Folder, Folder, Folder et al., 1997, and both positive responses, all right? So if you take the mean response of these three studies, 1,743 pounds. 
Yeah, and these are suckling and or milk feeding studies, and I don't think suckling's important. The Full Bear 97 study actually tested suckling versus bucket feeding, and there was no difference. Uh, they did not feed milk replacer, but I don't think milk replacers, the, the point here, or milk or milk replacers, not the point here, it's calories and nutrients above maintenance. And their equivalent intakes were about 1.6 to 2.3 gallons per day versus about a gallon a day for the control. And what I think is interesting here is if you look at this 1,743 pounds, I have a different perspective on that. And my perspective would be there are parts of the country where we're being challenged or being asked by consumers not to use technologies like somatotropin. You know, so in the face of being asked not to use a technology that makes animals more efficient, that gives us more milk, we, we need to then consider, okay, what other management technique can I use that's going to help me recover that milk? You know, so the question would be, given that, how much milk does the average first lactation animal make given POSLAC or VST per label, right? And the reality is it's somewhere between 1,600 and 1,800 pounds of milk, maybe 1,900 in a really good herd, you know, because it's herd dependent. But the, the point here is that this response that you see on this slide and this data is pretty much equivalent to a BST response for a first lactation animal. So that's a different context for me, but that's kind of the way I think about this. And, you know, and then if we could use BST, we're probably going to get twice the effect. That's an even bigger positive. So let's just keep going. So this was a study conducted at the University of Illinois. Um, it was published as an abstract, and uh, Dr. Drakeley likes to run his studies from uh, April to October, likes to avoid the snow. So that's what he did here. He ran this study in two blocks. He ran it one summer and then again another summer. And But if you look at all the data, so he said either 1.25 or 2.2 pounds of dry matter per day from milk replacer to 42 days. And this was a 28-20 milk replacer. Age of first calving, 24.6 versus 25. Body weight of calving was pretty much identical. Milk yield response, 1,843 pounds of milk for the calves who were fed the enhanced uh, milk replacer. But because he did this over two years, we could look at the year effect. In the first year, he got 3,000 pounds. He observed 3,000 pounds of milk. In the second year, he observed 800 pounds of milk. All right? But on average, 1843. When I asked him about that, his, and why he thinks there was such a difference, his response was, we had terrible uh, crypto scours. We had a lot of cryptosporidium in those calves in that second year, and they scoured for a couple months, and we couldn't seem to get it under control. So I don't know whether that's the cause or not, but it, what it allows us to do is think about what does an immune challenge mean? What does it mean when they... They consume the nutrients, but they can't really absorb the nutrients, and maybe even though they were consuming them, obviously the growth performance was going to be uh, decreased in those calves that were scouring a lot. So maybe what it says to me is that these calves, you know, that health is important, but health is important only because if they're not healthy, it takes away from the growth response, and the calves can be very sensitive to that. All right, so it gives us some indication that, that this all ties together, but health is important only to help keep those calves growing and eating properly. This study that was just published last year um, was ad-lib milk or milk replacer, and then they weaned them onto a low-protein diet. And that low-protein diet was about 13.5% to 14% crude protein. What I like about this is that the calves that were fed whole milk or milk replacer prior to weaning didn't seem to matter. What mattered is, if you know, do all did matter, but what's more important is that if they didn't have adequate protein post weaning, they did not perform as well, which means that once we wean them, we actually have to pay attention to the nutrient requirements and, and keep managing them for optimum gain, because if we don't, we could lose that milk response. And in the end, those calves that were fed whole milk and supplemented with the adequate pro or additional protein to meet the real protein requirement made about 1,600 pounds more milk in the first lactation. All right. So if we summarize all the available data right now, 
aside from one other study, we can see that for all studies that are citable, they're all positive except for this study out of the UK. And if we look at the study out of the UK, there was a small, but probably not, or small and non-significant difference in, in pre-weaning calf growth. Thus, maybe it wasn't enough of a difference to establish a milk response. But for the rest of these studies, it's all quite a positive response. So pre-weaning milk or milk replacer, and I think what's fun about this is that it's not just milk studies and they're not just suckling studies. There are several milk replacer studies in here. So it says that getting more nutrients in these calves prior to weaning from milk or milk replacer uh, is essential for seeing this response and that we can program these calves to be better milk cows. Right, so we've got a pretty good body of literature, and, and some people might argue that not all of these differences are statistical. Well, I'm going to talk about what that might mean. This Hugh Chester Jones, the work out of Minnesota, is 1,800 pounds, but it's not significantly different. Well, that leads to the idea of how do we analyze these studies and how much variation is there within herd to allow us to detect a statistically significant difference versus just a numerical difference. But I my animal breeder, my geneticist friends would say if you can, with simple statistics, even if it's not significant, if you can detect 1,800 pounds, that's a lot of milk, right? And, and you know, I'm going to tell you why they would say that here in just a minute. So we, I think we have to look at what that means. So if we have summarized this data, the average milk yield response is about 1,700 pounds. As I said earlier, similar to an average BST response in first lactation cattle. That $1,500 or $15 a hundred weight milk, that's $255 worth of revenue. At $18 a hundred weight milk, that's about $306 increased income or revenue for the first lactation. And obviously, we need to calculate the net returns. I'll do that as I summarize. So as I mentioned, there are probably different ways to analyze this data. I've mentioned the term epigenetics. I've talked about DNA. We, that made us think about are there other mathematical approaches to analyzing this data that may make it less biased and may give us more information. So uh, with one of my uh, colleagues here and a co-author, uh, Dr. Bob Everett, we used the test day model to evaluate this over multiple years of data. And in the interest of time, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about a test day model other than it's the same process statistical process that would be used uh, to estimate predicted transmitting abilities, uh, milk heritabilities for traits, uh, and things of that nature. So it's the same kind of mathematical treatment of the data as we would use to do a genetic evaluation that you would see in a SIRE summary. So it should be more robust, actually, than just looking at 305 milk uh, and, and doing a simple uh, mixed model analysis. The data within our own herd in 1998, this actually wasn't my decision, it was Dr. Larry Chase's decision. He said, gee, the calves on the research look really good. Can we feed the herd calves this way? And I said, sure, why not? Uh, so we implemented a feeding program in our own herd that basically tried to double the growth rate. Uh, and it was targeting at least two pounds a day pre-weaning average daily gain. We've got about 1,244 first lactations from that wondered if any calf measurement had any relationship to first lactation milk yield, so things that anybody could measure on the farm. So we looked at birth weight, weaning weight, average daily gain until weaning, gain in hip height, gain in wither height, and then we didn't have enough data, so we went to a commercial herd in northern New York and grabbed some uh, four years worth of data, which we'll share with you, about pre pubertal average daily gain, and finally, in our own herd, we looked at intake over maintenance from milk replacer uh, because we did have that data in our own herd. So, and here's where you recognize that our herd is like everybody else's. We've got a, we might have a research herd, but it's, it's real data. The range in growth rate in our data set for the Cornell herd was 0.23 to 3.5 pounds per day, <laughs> which is pretty extreme. Now, and I think that just represents the fact that that we have real data and this isn't unusual and I think everybody would be able to demonstrate the same thing. Why the range in growth if the program is the same year round? That's a great question. And we've learned back to the maintenance requirements because we feed the same thing in July that we feed in January. 
even though we see what would be considered twice the industry standard amount, it obviously is still not enough in the winter time to stimulate this milk production response. And we're going to come back to that in just a minute. So we looked at this. Year of calving was significant. We still haven't quite understood what year of calving is telling us, um, but it is significant. Average daily gain was also quite significant. All right, so for every pound of average daily gain prior to weaning, milk yield increased by 706 pounds in the first lactation, and that was significant. But there's more to it than that. So what we did then is we looked at first lactation, second lactation, and third lactation responses because this allowed us to look at lifetime milk response. So this is the effect of nutrient intake from milk replacer on milk yield over three lactations. And in our data, we do not have we do not have starter intake, okay? We feed it, but we unfortunately don't have that kind of information, so we're just basing all of this. We're recognizing that starter is important, but we're also saying that, you know, we feed a lot of milk replacer and we can make some use of that data. So in the first lactation, calves that were fed uh, greater amounts, or calves that had for every, I'm sorry, calves, that uh, for every 2.2 pounds of average daily gain, they produced 1,871 pounds more milk in the first lactation, highly significant. In the second lactation, these 826 calves came out of these 1,244 animals, 1,957 pounds, highly significant. These 450 animals in the third lactation came out of the previous groups, still positive at 106 pounds, but nothing, nothing quite close to significant. But if we average first to third lactation for those 450 animals, for every 2.2 uh, pounds of average daily gain, we see 5,000 pounds of milk, highly significant. And we've done some further analysis on cases, uh, on respiratory cases, on diarrhea, and on antibiotic treatment. And we do now know that when we gave these calves, if they were if they required antibiotics and we gave them antibiotics, we did lose some milk on that, and we've got that coming out in the publication. It wasn't available for the slides, uh, but that will be out soon, we hope. Here's the test day model residuals by temperature at birth, and this gets back to the feeding above maintenance. So you can see here the calves born in the wintertime made less milk than the calves born in the warmer temperatures. This may be some of the daylight effects that have been published. But given the information that we have, we could highly correlate this to intake over maintenance. And our thought process based on the data we have so far is that if we gave these calves in the wintertime adequate nutrients, that we could actually bring this up to equal this or increase it. So because it looks like it's simply an intake over maintenance response. All right, and I see that we're starting to run out of time, so I'll move through some of these slides. So actually, we looked at this response as a function of intake over maintenance. And in those first lactation animals, they produced 518 pounds more milk for every mcal above maintenance. It was highly significant. Positive in the second lactation, not significant. We don't really understand that. In the third lactation, 740, 774 pounds, highly significant. And first to third lactation in those 450 animals for every mcal of energy over maintenance, it was almost 2,000 pounds of milk, highly significant. So it says that, that it's really mcals above maintenance that's really important here, and that's the way we're starting to talk about it. What was fascinating, and again, I mentioned that my co-author was, a, was a, a geneticist, and Bob had spent his life studying this, and, and this was the most surprising piece of information to him because for years he had studied genetic variation and, and tried to understand what was how to implement it, how to control it, how to enhance productivity. In this study, 22% of the variation of first lactation milk yield was explained by pre-weaning growth rate up to weaning. And, and there's no genetic trait that accounts for that much variation. And, and this is, he was dumbfounded by this. Um, and And you know, said to me that this is, uh, this is much bigger than a lot of the other things you've ever paid attention to. And to give it some context, uh, in a few minutes, we've got a couple minutes I'll wrap up quickly. Genetic selection yields about 150 to 250 pounds of milk per lactation. What this data really means is pre-weaning calf nutrition and management can yield four to eight times more milk 
than genetic selection for lactation. Because it's now, now as I've shown you, it's a lifetime response. Now the geneticist will jab me and say, you know what, Van Amber, that's fine, but we make that one breeding decision and it's there for life and we don't have to manage it. You guys have to manage this every day. And I know that's true. Uh, we have to work a little harder at it, but this is a pretty profound amount of milk relative to genetic selection. And it doesn't mean that we should put less emphasis on genetic selection. What it means is after we've made that choice to create a, a more superior animal, we better take care of them because <laughs> they're going to yield more milk. Okay? So very quickly, I'm going to skip a few slides here. We did some of our own in-house calculations. Um, with some help from Jason Tarsi's in our pro dairy group. And what we found here, after all of our analysis, is in the first lactation, assuming 800 pounds of milk with a net present value discount on the milk income, profit increased by $211 in that first lactation. And this is only a first lactation calculation. Uh, Mike Overton from the University of Georgia did a very similar type of analysis using some field data, data from Bob Corbett, a little bit of information from me, a lot from some herds that Bob Corbett works with, um, and his number came out to be with the additional value of the milk, the advantage for the accelerated calves was $231 in his analysis. So we're within $20 of each other using very different data sets but similar types of information. So what that means is that there's a real economic value. We can put a real economic value now to feeding these calves um, more nutrients prior to weaning. And again, we're focused mostly on milk or milk replacer. We've got to keep we've got to keep starter grain in here, but we know that we can't get high rates of gain in the first four to five weeks of life by encouraging them to eat more starter grain. It's got to come from liquid nutrients because that's what Mother Nature intended. So with that, I'll summarize, you know, basically nutrient intake in their life appears to impact lactation milk yield. All the data are positive to neutral. We don't really understand what's going on. That's what we're looking for. Uh, but this data clearly demonstrates that early life management enhances the effect of genetic selection for milk yield. And the bottom line here in my mind is that between colostrum management and nutrient intake, there's a very positive uh, impact on net returns to the dairy farm. I think that's really what this comes down to. So with that, I'll take some questions. All right. Just as a reminder, to submit your questions to Dr. Van Amberg or Dr. Jean Boomer from Arm & Hammer Animal Nutrition, please click on that Q&A tab on the top navigation bar of your screen and type in your question and click on the Ask button. And that will submit your question, and we can get your question answered by these gentlemen. Uh, Dr. Boomer, are you there with us? The country yes, I is no longer in lecture mode. All right, fantastic. So we will take questions for either Dr. Van Anford or Dr. Boomer. Dr. Boomer, did you have any comments? Do Dr. Boomer, did you have anything that you wanted to add with for the presentation? No, I don't have anything to add right now. Go ahead with the question. All right. It looks like we have a question in. Is there justification for feeding higher fat MR in the thermoneutral environment? For instance, 30% versus 20% fat. Um, yeah, that's a tough question. I would say, I would say the conference is in lecture mode. I would um, I would not discourage the feeding of higher fat milk replacers in the warmer climates, but I would caution that in in when we've done that in the past, that higher fat content of the milk replacer tends to satisfy the calf or from a caloric perspective, and they're not quite as encouraged to eat more starter grain. So we just it doesn't mean that we shouldn't do it because in the reality, whole milk or pasteurized waste milk, if appropriate, is going to be in that 28 to 35 percent fat. So a milk replacement at 30 percent fat really isn't any different than whole milk. So I'm not going to discount that. I just want to make sure, and I'm not going to say not to do it, I just want to make sure that everybody recognizes that as we move the fat content of milk replacer up or the liquid diet, 
we've got to manage that starter intake much, much better and be just aware of it. And I think that's what I would encourage people to think about. All right, our next question. In your economic analysis, what is the effect of feed efficiency in early life? What is the effect of feed efficiency in early life? Well, let's see here. Um, so here's in our economic analysis, I put the slide back up there. People can see that pre-weaning cost per pound of gain was 273 on the conventional. This was in our data. In the intensified, it was, well, what we, I don't know if intensified is the right word. I like biologically normal. The bottom line is it was not quite 20 cents per pound of gain higher. Right, so there was a little bit of cost associated with that, but based on all of our data, what that yielded us was an earlier age at first calving. Okay, and assuming that body weight at calving is kept constant, we saw less calves dying, we had less sickness, um, but we did feed them more feed, so in the end, you know, it was pretty much a wash. And you can see here that the cost was pretty much the same in our analyses, and where we ended up positive was when we started in looking at the increased milk yield, right? And the same kind of thing was observed down here when we looked at uh, the data from uh, Mike Overton. He looked at uh, cost per day, 288 versus 316 per day over the growth period. So, so a little higher cost but you calve them earlier, you pick up the feed efficiency, and it looks like we're picking up more milk. So that's, as a package, as a system, it looks quite positive. All right. Our next question, when do you recommend starting to use calf starter? I like to recommend, personally, in my own work and what we do in our own herd, we don't feed calf starter for the first week, uh, simply because, we see calves that just, it's too expensive. These days, all feed's expensive, right? Calf starter's also expensive. And that first week, even though you want to get the calf familiar with it, they're still trying to figure out who they are, where they're at, and, and what they're really supposed to do. And they tend just to drool on it, dribble their milk on it. They don't really consume a lot. So for the first seven days, we don't offer them starter, but we will start getting, we will put starter in front of them on day eight. And, and we want to make sure that we do whatever we can then to encourage starter intake. Yeah, and we're, we're very pro rumen development and starter intake. We're just now learning that we got to figure out how to balance that with higher nutrient intakes uh, from milk or milk replacer. The next question, what should the CP be in a starter that follows an accelerated milk feeding program? Ah, that's a great question. Um, so you can look at all the data, and all the data is going to tell you that probably nothing more, all the published data is going to tell you nothing more than about 20% on a dry matter basis. Uh, our in-house data, that isn't all published yet, and unfortunately some of it's proprietary, which is why it hasn't been published. Uh, our in-house data would say 22 to 23% is where we pick up better feed efficiencies. And again, I don't have time to go into all the data. Um, so if all you're looking at is the absolute requirement of the calf, 20% on a dry matter basis is probably okay. But when we look at transition and weaning efficiencies and being able to maintain growth rates, uh, a slightly higher protein level seems to be uh, uh, useful. All right, so that's why we end up somewhere around 23% with most of the starters that we're using and, and that we would recommend. The next question. You spoke of correlations to growth rate, yet mentioned protein having a larger impact. Were there any correlations to protein intake? We didn't look at protein intake directly. Uh, this, is, uh, this is from my looking at, yeah, that's a really good question, and I suppose we should go back and look at that. Thank you for whoever asked that question. Like I said, you never know where good questions might come from. Um, but but the um, we looked at it in total relative to the, the dry matter intake of some of these milk replacers, uh, these higher protein milk replacers, compared to the controls versus the whole milk. So when we think about that, 
knowing what I know about body composition and protein synthesis, um, it looks like from all of that data that, that protein deposition and protein synthesis, so one, to get protein synthesis, you've got to have energy, but also to get protein synthesis, you've got to supply enough protein to go with that energy-driven uh, demand. So I think the two go in concert. And it doesn't mean that you're, we want to feed more protein and less energy. We just want to make sure that if we're feeding more energy, we've given them enough protein to adequately use it and not burn it as energy. And, I, I, and that's a question, I guess I'll frame it differently. When people say, gee, can I just feed more of a 2020? And the answer is, yes, you can do that and still achieve the same energetics, but they're going to be protein deficient. And I think based on the literature and based on what I'm seeing, you're not.